Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to start the forum. Welcome to the Minerals to Metals online forum. Today's topic will be the circular economy and sustainable metals. How do we get there? I guess would be the main question. So just before we start, I'm just going to do some Zoom etiquette. Please keep your mic muted and your video turned off unless you're speaking or um, part of the Q&A session. If you have any questions during the presentation, please enter them into the chat um, with the name of the speaker you're directing your question to. After the presentations, if you want to speak, raise your hand. Please note that this forum is recorded and will be available to the public. You can make yourself anonymous by changing your name and leaving your questions in the chat if you wish to do so. And if you'd like to be added to the mailing list, please send me a message either during the discussions or an email afterwards. So I'm going to just start us off by defining the circular economy and then I will hand over to more profound experts than this little guppy in the ocean. Um, so, yes, um, I would like to also thank the experts for coming, coming forward. Um, I really appreciate and yeah. I think I'm a little bit nervous because of that, but thank you so much for being here. Um, I suppose the first thing to say would be that mining hasn't got a great rep. <laughs> We've got, it's, it's had quite a significant social and environmental impact. And the true cost isn't necessarily borne by those that have the financial benefits uh, we can see that, especially from last week, the um, need to, sus to establish a sustainable post-mining economy um, is, is quite an important thing to do. But besides all of these negatives, we wouldn't have our current society as it stands. Nothing that anything that can't be grown needs to be mined, and we need to do it in a way that is sustainable, essentially. So what we want to try and move away from is mining virgin material and using that as an exception rather than the rule. We need to update our understanding of the life cycle of mineral discovery and not seeing it only as the life cycle of the mine in a traditional sense. So, one of the most difficult things to do when you step into this green sustainable space is navigating the terminology. There is a lot of what is called sustainable babble out there, and I am definitely a victim to it. I think it makes it, but, but it's very important still to establish those definitions, especially for policy. So, what I'm going to present is two definitions um, and we can debate those definitions during the Q&A session but what we can see is the importance of establishing an effective de definition and this can be seen in the National Waste Management Strategy, the third draft, where we have an effective concept of the circular economy established but when it comes to actually substantially implementing that definition, what the policy actually does and what it says it does is very different. So it's important not only to define, but to see where that definition is implemented. One of the definitions of the circular economy is that a circular economy describes an economic system that is based on a business model that moves away from the end of life um, concept towards reducing and all the other R's that are involved, reuse, recycle, refurbishment and remanufacturing, etc., in production and distribution and consumption processes. It, the definition speaks to a systemic operational space 
which works at a micro, meso and macro level. The macro, the micro level we see consumer, consumer awareness, um, producer responsibility. At the meso level, we see repair cafes, eco-industrial parks and upcycling centers. And then at the macro level, we see city planning, regional development, which I would say tune in next week because we're going to be speaking to the beneficiation policies in the SADC region. And then at a global level, level we're speaking to international standards. And then lastly, a key element of this def definition is sustainable development. This is one of those really broad, difficult things to pin down. And whenever I read it in a in an article, I don't really understand what exactly they're speaking to, but the core elements of sustainable development is economic prosperity, social equity, and looking towards the, um, the future with environmental sustainability in mind. When I approached the panelists, I realized that this definition can be debated and Sally Ann can weigh in on this um, maybe a little bit later, is that there's, an, this, there's a little bit of um, fault in the definition I gave. Um, it seems to focus too narrowly on the end of life rather than looking towards design and seeing avoidance rather than reduction as core elements. So this definition comes from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And the definition that they provide for circular economy is looking beyond the current take, make, waste, extractive industrial model. A circular economy aims to define growth, focusing on positive society-wide benefits. It entails gradually decoupling economic activity from the consumption of finite resource and design waste out of the system and depend by the transition to renewable energy sources, the circular model builds economic, natural and social capital. So you can see on the slide there, the basic diagram that tries, that, that conceptualizes this and the three core principles being designing waste, uh, designing out waste and pollution, um, keeping products and materials in use so we don't represent as consumers in the system, we rather present as users, and then regenerating natural systems. Lastly, I'd like to give a brief outline as what could, to the main challenges that we find um, against the circular economy. And the biggest one is our consumer capitalist society. We have a very specific concept of private property and the rights associated with this consumption um, whilst avoiding the responsibility and the costs of that consumption. So um, our last pre presentation on sustainable um, post economies spoke to this, how old mines are often just resold to smaller miners who aren't actually able to rehabilitate the land as effectively as they, um, as, as their predecessor. So, Externalizing the true cost of any action is a very big problem within our economic structure. Consumers also don't have any obligation to reduce their consumption, and they expect a certain level of convenience. And there's also a fair amount of sustainable facades where we don't necessarily recognize the true impact of something and rather use our sustainable bubble to present as green. Four other challenges briefly mentioned, well, uh, is, and there is sort of often overlap, is the realization of economies of scale, which is where production costs per unit decreases as the scale of production increases. In the circular economy context, it's important to recognize that this benefit can't just be financial, it has to, our output has to look towards the economic, social and environmental um, benefit. The, another big challenge is the lack of cooperation and ineffective policy. 
which I think Linda will speak to more, and then the lack of infrastructure and investment, which speaks to an important element of finding out where this end use market lies for the, the products. And then lastly, the lack of data and transparency, which I think Harold will speak to. On that slightly depressing note, um, we need to recognize that this is an essential threat, existential threat, and it cannot be ignored. So hopefully the circular economy can be implemented in an effective way. So let's hand over to our experts. Linda, will you please turn on your video? Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, everyone can hear me all right, I trust. So I think that um, I've got a couple of notes that I'm going to go through in, in the next 10 minutes, and I'm, I'm very happy to share these notes afterwards um, that can be distributed to everybody who's um, attending today. But I think this issue around uh, mining, around metals, around the circular economy is a, a very timely one and a very important one in terms of South Africa's future economic sustainability and economic development. And I'll touch on why I, I say that in some of the following points. When, when we were discussing in preparation for this, the point was mentioned that reduction in mining should be the focus. And a statement like that has kind of significant implications. And if it highlighted for me in terms of what are we actually talking about when we, are we talking about circular economy and mining and hence reduction in mining should be the focus? Or is this about circular economy and metals and how we essentially retain metals within our economy, circulating within our economy at their maximum value for as long as possible? Because these have two very different approaches. Um, and typically we find that mining itself tends to sit outside of the circular economy thinking. If you look at the, uh, the butterfly, butterfly diagram that we saw just now, is mining always to send, tends to sit up above uh, on top of the wings of the butterfly. And the question is, is mining part of it? Is it inherent in the circular economy thinking? So what are we really talking about? Are we talking about reducing primary metals extraction in, in terms of reducing mining and substituting our metals demand from secondary resources, from waste? Are we talking about increasing our metals production by adding our secondary resources to our primary resource extra extraction? In other words, increased consumption. Are we talking about shifting to secondary resources where our primary resources are or may soon become depleted in South Africa? In other words, maintaining metal security through substitution, or is it in fact all of these? And I think it's important that we understand these different options and these different approaches in terms of um, mining and metals and the circular economy because they have implications in terms of existing players. So if mines were looking at secondary resources or waste as a cost effective top up to their current primary resource extraction, that has implications on existing players because we already have informal reclaimers, informal pickers, we already have scrap dealers, we already have buyback centers, whether formal or informal. We have these entrepreneurs in the value chain that are already recovering metals uh, from our waste system. So we need to understand the impacts uh, if, if big mines or if big business move into the space in terms of the small businesses that are currently playing there. So I think it's important that there's a discussion around this issue. I think also there's a question that needs to be asked in terms of understanding mining and metals within the context of a circular economy. A question to the mining community, a question to government, a question to academia, in terms of have we modeled the magnitude of the metal circular economy opportunity for South Africa? Do we truly understand the size and the nature of the opportunity that a circular economy presents for sustainable metals management in South Africa. And I think for me, that question highlights a number of issues and it, it certainly highlights a number of sub questions, which I think that we need to unpack as a country. I think that first of all, it highlights the issue around data and information. And this is something that has plagued the waste sector uh, in South Africa, it's not only a South African issue, but it's a, a developing country issue. 
do we have reliable data and information to be able to answer this question of the circular economy opportunity when it comes to, to metals management? But I think the sub questions that this question raises for me, and I'd like to see more research being done on these, I'd like to see more evidence being provided by business, by government is, do we know, for example, how many years of economically viable primary metals we have in the ground in South Africa? Do we understand which resources the South African economy is dependent on? If we want to achieve the NDP 2030, what resources do we need? Which of those resources do we have in South Africa? Which are we reliant on in terms of imports? And how many years do we have left? Um, if you look at the approach that the European Union took, for example, around their circular economy thinking, a large part of it is based on their critical raw material approach in terms of which raw materials are critical to the future economic development of the EU. And they have put uh, strategies and investments uh, in place to be able to ensure that they can provide those resources sustainably into the future. Also, do we understand the impact of other countries transitioning to a circular economy on the South African economy? You know, there was a report that was published by TNO Netherlands uh, a few years ago, which showed that essentially South Africa stood to lose about 3% of its GDP if the European Union transitioned to a fully circular economy, because South Africa is a large exporter uh, to the EU of things like chromium, fluorospar, germanium, gold, phosphate, tungsten, for example. So what is the impact on our mining economy and our metals, uh, sustainable metals management, if others are shifting to more circular economies? Do we understand and do we know the value of metals that are lost to the South African economy, either through export or through landfilling of waste? The, the data which the Department of Environmental Affairs or now Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries published in the draft state of waste report would suggest that we're already doing quite well in terms of scrap metals. I think it was around about 80% uh, recovery and recycling. Some of our batteries, typically the lead acid batteries was at around about 90%. But also a lot of the metals that we are recovering are being exported. Uh, there was a 2017 report showed that uh, we're a net exporter of scrap metal to Pakistan, to India, to Bangladesh. So although we're recovering those metals, we're losing them from our economy. And then when it comes to electronic waste, for example, in fact, we have a very low recovery and recycling rate, only at around about 10%. So again, a lot of those resources are either sitting in people's studies, garages, basements, offices, and are not flowing back into the South African economy. So I think those were just some background issues that I wanted to touch on before I very briefly just speak to the challenges um, which we saw just now. So I think in terms of challenges, the, the first point that was mentioned was around the lack of um, a lack of appropriate policy in terms of driving the circular economy. You know, at this stage, there's only essentially one policy document, uh, a final approved policy document, which has made reference to the circular economy. And that's the Department of Science and Innovations, a science, technology and innovation white paper, which was gazetted last year. Uh, the third national waste management strategy does make reference to the circular economy, although with quite a narrow focus. And I think it's really, really important that people understand the circular economy is not just about waste management. It's not just about recycling. It's certainly not a synonym for recycling. You know, the circular economy applies to water, it applies to energy, to agriculture, to mobility, to infrastructure, to construction. It's, it's really around sustainable resource management in whatever sector that might be. So I think that there's still a lot that needs to be done in South Africa to provide very clear evidence in terms of the social, the economic and the environmental opportunities that a circular economy can provide for South Africa. And I think until we start to put those numbers on the table, it's going to find dif we're going to find difficulty in getting traction in terms of circular economy uptake in our policies. So I think it's really important that we do evidence this discussion in terms of the jobs that could be created, the, the businesses that could be established through a circular economy. The second point was around the producers not having uh, or not taking responsibility for the social and the environmental impacts of their products. And I think, you know, we've made some progress in the space in terms of extended producer responsibility, certainly as it relates to metal packaging, as it relates to electronic waste, as it relates to lighting. 
the intention was for government to place mandatory responsibility on producers of certain products to deal with their products at end of life. But unfortunately, we walked quite a journey. It was about five years uh, with the submission of industry waste management plans. And that process was since halted and um, government has now moved back to looking at EPR itself. So it's unfortunate that we've lost that time period now in terms of implementing mandatory EPR to make sure that we have mandatory targets um, in terms of diversion of metals, for example, from our landfill sites, really as a means of making sure that we retain these resources within our economy. The second issue, the third issue, sorry, was in terms of consumer consumption and behavior. You know, we do have very much a consumer-based economy, but what the circular economy does do, and the subset in terms of the sharing economy, is it starts to provide a very different thinking in terms of how we access goods and services. And so very often people think in terms of sustainability or the green economy as um, having a direct impact on you know, my lifestyle, what I use, what I consume, where I go. But I think that there's a lot of opportunity that we need to explore in terms of the sharing economy. And particularly for developing countries where so many people have not had access to certain goods and services. And this speaks to the issue of ownership, for example. So instead of every single South African owning a car, is it about access and ownership to the vehicle or is it about mobility and access to transportation? And uh, this obviously has implications in terms of how we manage our resources. Do we need, in, as, you know, do we need the kinds of metals uh, consumption or extraction that we currently have if we have more cars on the road that are simply providing a service, the likes of your Ubers and Lyfts, et cetera. Um, so this has implications in terms of our business models that we have um, in South Africa. And then the final issue in terms of um, challenges is around markets. And this for me really, really is critical. I've touched on this issue around the fact that we are exporting um, so many of our metals from South Africa. Um, we, we really need to focus on how we retain our resources in South Africa for as long as we possibly can in the value chain, because that means that we are retaining our jobs in the South African economy. It means we're creating businesses in the South African economy. So if you look at electronic waste, for example, although it's only a 10% uh, collection and, and recycling rate, the majority of our electronic waste is still dismantled, pre-processed and exported uh, to North America, to Europe or to Asia for further beneficiation. So we lose those resources from our economy. And, and I've always kind of pondered this point, you know, as a mining-based economy, why are we not beneficiating our electronic waste in South Africa? Why are we so quick to export our scrap metal to other developing countries when we should be looking at how we grow our economy and grow the use of those resources within our own economy? And then the final, before I end, is just to, to touch on this issue around the importance of science, technology, and innovation. Um, you know, the importance of evidencing this discussion around providing the data and the information that we need to make decisions in this space. Two of the projects which we're currently funding under the Waste RDI Roadmap, and I think Harrow will touch on one of them now, um, he is the grant holder on this project, is to assess the economy-wide prospects for a more sustainable circular economy in South Africa through material flow analysis. So how circular is the South African economy and where are there opportunities for increased circularity? The second study that we're currently funding is a technology landscape report and business case for the recycling of lithium ion batteries in South Africa. Currently, we don't generate sufficient quantities of these batteries to warrant investment in technology or at least traditional technology. And so the question is, are there more appropriate technologies? Is there opportunity to create a more regional secondary resources economy in SADC, for example, to create the tonnages that we need? And then there are a number of studies that we've completed that have been done by different universities in South Africa around electronic waste, around lighting. All of those studies are available on the Waste RDI Roadmap website. And then also the study that was done in 2017 around electronic waste dismantling pre-processing and processing in terms of the technology landscape that we have in South Africa. So just to, to reiterate that I think that um, you know, R&D and innovation has a critical role to play in terms of transitioning South Africa in its move towards a more circular economy and around evidencing this discussion, providing the knowledge that we need 
in terms of the social, the environmental, and the economic opportunities that a circular economy provides. And I'd like to end at that point, and we can pick up on any of those through uh, further Q&A at the end. Thank you. Thank you so much for placing all of the challenges into context. Um, I'd like to now invite Sally Ann Kasner to turn on her video and give her presentation. Hi, everybody. Uh, let me just quickly share my screen. Right, I hope, uh, I hope everyone can see, see the screen. Okay, perfect, yes. Great. So, yeah, uh, transition to circularity, and I intentionally put a question mark um, at the bot, uh, you know, at the end of that sentence, because I think it's, uh, Linda's raised some really, really good points, and I think I just also introduced the topic incredibly well. So thanks, guys, for, for framing it so nicely. Um, now to just get this to cooperate with me. Right. So... So just some of the context, um, again, is more than 100 billion tons of materials entered the global economy in 2017 to generate power, build infrastructure and homes, produce food, provide consumer goods such as clothes and, and phones. And uh, it, I've read numerous reports, and, and this one particular report where I've gotten this information from is that there are now more phones than people on the planet. And the amount of clothes that we purchase is forecast to reach about 92 million tons by 2030. Some estimates suggest that 99% of the things that people buy are discarded within six months of purchasing without the material being recovered. And that's because we have a inherently what's called a linear economy. And, in, and today we are speaking about how do we transition from this linear economy to a more circular one. And essentially, the linear economy works by extracting resources and manufacturing products from these resources that are sold to people and then generally disposed of after a very, very short period of use. One thing I think the pandemic uh, has done has really upended our normal economic activity. Um, and really, I think, dipping the global economy into what could become the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. But rather than to try to revive this system, that's inherently wasteful, can we not use this opportunity, if there is one with COVID, to create a more generate, regenerative economy? And the idea of the circular economy is quite simple, actually. It's to make better use of resources, close those loops of resource flows by fully recovering materials instead of wasting them and preventing waste and pollution by better design of products and materials and keeping them in use for longer. There really is a need for multiple change agents, including supply chain from mining, fabrication, manufacturing, retailers, and consumers. Um, and the difference is that this time, that we actually, all of these change agents need to speak to each other and collaborate to ensure that materials placed on the market can be managed. Often materials are placed on the market only for the challenge to be placed before a recycler to manage. And this is where we have definitely come unstuck, especially in the packaging space. Imagine if we design products with the next use in mind. And as a collective industry, we should be doing this before government policy or intervention. <laughs> and I know this is not necessarily always the case because often we wait for government policy or intervention. Traditional mining companies must explore new business models and capabilities that support circularity with an upstream operations and downstream with cutting edge customer offerings. And I read a statement by uh, the CEO of Anglo-American that in, uh, it's Marco T. Fani, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. <laughs> but he says a shift toward a more circular economy presents a significant opportunity for mining companies that are willing to embrace it by reimagining their business and partnering with the intermediate and end users of the essential metals and minerals they produce. To date, circular economy innovation um, from a mining perspective has really focused on operational improvements, but mining leaders have started to reconnect efficiency initiatives and the circular economy more explicitly, especially in the domains of energy, water use, carbon neutral operations. Downstream circularity is also evolving, driven by two major factors of supply risk and visibility throughout the value chain and customer pool by manufacturers that have embedded increasing levels of material sustainability into their products. 
Just an example on this, an original equipment manufacturer, OEM, led shift in the automotive industry towards greater circularity, both design and use of secondary materials as already having an impact on the mining companies. Renault is collaborating with large players in the metals recycling value chain to enhance recycling capabilities and develop mutually beneficially beneficial programs. And using, using its experience as a manufacturer, Renault provides valuable insights about end use of resources for car dismantling. So I wanna provide maybe a fairly radical idea uh, for the mining sector or metal sector. But just to bring to um, the table the option of leasing. And an example of leasing could be done from a consumer perspective. And I'll give you an example just of a washing machine. When we buy a washing machine, we're not buying the washing machine because we want the washing machine. We want the clothes, our clothes to be clean. And essentially, many operators and our, or sorry, uh, brand uh, manufacturers are seeing this as an opportunity of a different business model and rather leasing the washing machine on a perhaps a pay, pay per wash type of situation. So you never own the washing machine itself, but you, but you are able to clean your clothes. So another example, perhaps in the mining sector is metals, metals leasing as a cross value chain enabler. So this could be driven by fundamental ownership considerations on the upstream side of the value chain. One party retains ownership of the metals, which are transferred to the leasee, who enjoy, enjoys both charges and profits. In exchange, rent is paid to the owner and the metal returned at the end of the lease. The complicated nature of maintaining ownership throughout the uh, use phases with the changing value of the metal means that to date there are very limited successful examples of this approach but it creates powerful incentives in favor of recovery of the metal at the end of the life. One potential issue as well is that of nationalization, which could be required if the owner is the country of origin, but it could also create new business opportunity, notably in resource management and monitoring. Think about from the African context in South Africa, which uh, Linda raised earlier on in terms of our, how much we export. How do we manage something like this? perhaps through blockchain technology, which has the potential to fundamentally change the way of the mining industry and connect its supply chains and the way they operate. Blockchain solutions are applicable to all stakeholders connected to the broader value from financial institutions, ship operators to surveying lab laboratories, warehouses, and many others. And it's hoped that this will drive innovation and compliance beyond mining and smelting into connected industries that might otherwise have lacked the resources to develop technology to address these needs. A tracing system that increases the value chain transparency could allow to better capture the value of minerals at the end of its use. Traceability of resources is not commonplace in, um, in mining or metals, perhaps for the exception of diamonds and maybe a few others. Um, the model is offered by food and agricultural value chains where, for example, software like ClearThrough or HarvestMark ensure the traceability of fresh produce back to the farm level. While mining value chains are more complex, agricultural products are also reused and remanufactured and offer similarities to other commodities. Besides providing transparency, trans traceability can also help enable new ownership models around metals leasing. And then I read about a Swiss-based open mineral uh, um, said that it was joining forces with a US blockchain startup called Consensus, and they've established a company called Minerac aiming to make mineral trading and supply chains more efficient. They aim to connect the mineral supply chain and mining to shipping, surveying, warehousing, and financing. So this is starting to happen, which is really, really quite exciting. I think it's fair to say that new partnership models require new um, um, partnerships, uh, including downstream companies and manufacturers working together with metals producers who take scrap back from them um, and this is largely happening um, quite a lot in the metals industry. And what about scrap treatment in particular end of use, end of use recycling could be enabled by expanded close, closed loop systems in which the producer or an alliance of players along the value chains is responsible for production, collection, recycling and reproduction. 
These partnerships, for instance, between a metal producer, manufacturer and, and mail company or a, a transport company would allow appliances and products like old kitchen goods to be reinserted into the production cycle. But this collaboration between metals companies and end industries would also help create redesigned, standardized, durable products, which enable reuse. And I think what needs to come through strongly is the design aspect of the circular economy. In this case, the two parties will need to share benefits, whether as a license to operate, increase profits or increase market shares. Mining also has a role to play in assisting reuse by collaboration with metals companies over redesigned specifications. I found a rental model in the, and, and rental models aren't necessarily um, commonplace perhaps in the metals industry. Um, they are common in many other industries. Uh, for example, uh, CHEP pallets have a rental model of all their pallets, which are across the globe. They, they are used and they have a rental model. But this particular rental model I found for ArcelorMittal, and they use um, their steel sheet piling on a rental model basis, or they offer it on a rental model basis, where these um, sheet piles can be used at least 10, 10 times over a period that may reach 15 years. And at the end of their life, 100% of the steel sheet piles can then be re-enter the material stream. Some of the challenges though related to this are cited as being logistics to ensure a fast response and delivery to the construction site, financial in terms of working capitals re required to ensure that a large variety of sections are readily available from stock to satisfy the customer demand. Technical, for example, when piles are returned damaged, they have to be repaired and sent for potentially premature recycling. And then the regulatory aspect from a company perspective where um, maybe green public procurement doesn't support the rental business model uh, in re you know, by recognizing the environmental performance. I'm almost there. Um, in terms of the African Circular Economy Network, I just want to introduce that to you because the continent of Africa is inherently circular. Um, however, rapid urbanization and industrialization is potentially threatening the system. The African Circular Economy Network is becoming an increasingly important organization bringing together circular economy practitioners across the continent, continent to share knowledge with one another and to build circular uh, economy evidence in Africa. ASIN currently has 31 country chapters located across all regions in the continent, um, but uh, cognizance needs to be taken that the strategies and materials required by developed continents such as Europe to enter renewable energy transition is reliant on an extraction-based economy for the necessary components and parts for battery storage, for example. However, we need to give thought uh, in terms of how this relationship and the business models will work within a circular context, as it cannot be undertaken at the expense of the African continent, which then gets locked into a linear operating system as a supplier of the required extracted resources. Recent years have seen the emergence of the supranational initiatives for driving economic development through the circular economy. Rwanda, South Africa, and Nigeria, for instance, are working with the United Nations Environment Programme, the World Economic Forum, to develop continent-wide alliance to spur Africa's trans transformation to more circularity. Um, one of our co-founders of the African Circular Economy Network, uh, he emphasizes that the implementation of circular policies in Africa has the potential to open up a better development path, building on the defining characteristics of resilience and resourcefulness and enabling Africa to leapfrog to sustainable, equitable, prosperous and circular economy. And that's where I'll leave it and look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, especially with that, with Lisa, the concept of just spider diagrams out from my brain. I'm very excited about it. Um, so I'd like to quickly um, introduce uh, Harrow's, he's, I can't seem to see him, but he can, um, yeah, start his video. And, and Hello. Right. Okay. And I'm uh, sharing my screen. Uh, so yeah, pleasure to join the forum again after, after some time. Um, the last few online forums um, seem to clash with other meetings that, that I've had to, to attend to, uh, but a pleasure to be with the forum today. 
Um, reminds me, I think the last time I seriously uh, engaged with the forum as a speaker, I spoke about zero waste sometime last year or the year before. Um, and there certainly are links here. Um, so, yeah, um, I should just shout in case I can't be heard or my screen can't be seen, but it all seems to be good. Perfect, yeah. Um, so, we can see. Yeah. Something. So all three speakers uh, ahead of me have uh, spoken to various interpretations and definitions of the term circular economy. Sorry, um, Harrow, um, it just seems like your video is very close to your face. I'm not sure if maybe there's a way to just give us a better image. Of myself? Yes, not there we sure. go, yeah. perfect. Is that, is that a little bit better? Okay, great. Yes. Um, so there are many, uh, how shall we say, fancy and wish adjectives that come at us uh, through many of the definitions of circular economy. And, and of course, uh, we, we understand and also through the literature that's looked at this um, and all the various definitions that fundamentally this, this is a new manifestation of the idea of sustainable development. and, and there very much are these ambitions that that come with such uh, such terms, um, the inclusivity, the regenerative nature, and so on. In in the short input that I'm going to do today, I'm going to go very much in the opposite direction and reduce circular economy to a quantitative analysis. Um, not to say that. Uh, quantitative analysis by itself is sufficient to do justice to, to the ambitions in circular economy. But without a quantitative analysis, we wouldn't really know what we're talking about. Um, circularity, after all, does imply some, some understanding that flows of materials are indeed circular. So, we use a tool called material flow analysis to get to, uh, to that understanding. And I'm going to share here, all right, um, if I can get this right. And now I need to go to the next one, please. Yes, right. You should now see a diagram that shows material flows for China back in 2002. Um, and uh, this is what we sort of generate at the end of a process of doing a material flow analysis. Um, this is a, a diagram that we call a Sankey diagram. Many of you will be familiar with it, others maybe not so much. Uh, but essentially what, what a Sankey diagram does, it, it has arrows uh, representing flows, in this case inputs and outputs, uh, and the width of each arrow is proportional to the magnitude of the flow. And so in the case of China, back in the day, um, and the numbers of the flows are actually given here as well. They're given in, in units of petagrams, 10 to the 15 gram. This is bigger tons or billions of metric tons. Um, and so you can see that uh, back in the, in the day, China imported some 730 million tons of material and exported some 700 million tons of material, for example, and that it extracted or produced domestically in terms of biotic raw materials. So those are those that are not mined of uh, 1.46 billion tons. And uh, there are also some flows to and from the atmosphere that are shown here. But what really stands out in this diagram is the mining related material the abiotic materials. Uh, and there again, uh, what really stands out is that very large flow of unused extraction, non-saleable extraction. And anybody who works around the mining industry knows that, that, that the amounts of material that you move in order to get to the amounts of material that you want to sell are often very large. Um, and so what this diagram does is just reminds us that we could never really seriously think about using all the material that gets dug up in a mining 
heavy economy. It's just much bigger than the amount of material we, we need. Uh, one other feature of this diagram is that the inputs in total are larger than the outputs in total. The system is not at steady state, as we chemical engineers would say, uh, but there is accumulation. There are additions to stock or to infrastructure. In this case, 5.38 billion tons a year. And if you want to get a graphical image of what was going on, then uh, do this Google image search for Shanghai then and now. Um, and uh, that will just give you a visual impression of where all these additions to stock went. Um, and there is a URL here as well if you use my slides later. But a quick Google image search might turn it up for you. Really impressive. Let me move on. So the material flow analysis method has been with us for a while, uh, but it is being improved all the while. And we are, as Linda mentioned, currently working on a project to apply the cutting edge of, of material flow analysis to the South African context. And we are working with some of the co-authors of this paper that came out in 2018, which um, innovated the material flow analysis method um, and applied it to the EU28 block. And this diagram just shows that the uh, latest methods combine a couple of approaches. In orange, it uses sort of more economic data. These are, are materials rather than value-based flows uh, in terms of imports and extraction. Uh, but these are in many countries available through so-called material national material accounts or material flow accounts. And then it uses official waste data, which are in blue. Um, and uh, that is indeed a tricky situation in many countries. And then in between, in the green, it uses good old chemical engineering mass balance principles to make sure that the orange and the blue actually gel together. And so that's the method that is currently being used. And so out of this analysis, these authors produced a material flow picture for Europe that is significantly more sophisticated than the one I showed earlier on for China, uh, dating back to 2002 in data and 2007 in publication. So this is a 2018 publication on 2014 data. Of course, both China and Europe are very interesting to South Africa in terms of exports of, of metals. And so I think it's useful to know what's going on in those countries. So this diagram uh, then shows uh, the imports into Europe, the domestic extraction, and then the exports in terms of often manufactured goods, but sometimes also uh, materials uh, that are recovered. Um, and then it shows outputs to nature, and these are shown as DPO, just domestic processed output emissions, and then waste. Uh, so stuff that goes to, um, oops, going back, to air and water and stuff that goes into the solid waste system. And of course, it also shows how circular Europe really is. Um, and and that, uh, again, we're looking here at gigatons. Um, um, yes, that's right, gigatons per year, billions of tons a year. And we're seeing that, uh, something like 700 million tons of materials actually circulate in, in Europe in this estimate. And it's really uh, useful to go and look at how these are made up. And the, the bars um, show the four major groups of material from which these material flows are made up. And they are non-metallic minerals in gray, metal ores and metals in blue, the fossil energy materials in orange and the biomass in green. And in the next image that these authors produced, they unpacked this diagram into the four groups, into four diagrams. And, and here it becomes really interesting because we're now starting to understand where things are very circular and where not. So I specifically want to draw your attention to the um, top left diagram for non-metallic minerals. 
uh, and the bottom right for metal ores. And you can see that for metal ores, we have the largest degree of circularity of the four diagrams. Um, if you look at the bottom cycle there, relative to what is extracted. And of course, there's also still a sizable amount of extractive waste uh, directly related to some mining that still does happen in the EU28. Um, by contrast, if you look at the non-metallic minerals, which also have a very significant relationship to mining, you see that um, what goes back around the loop is actually rather small in relation to what is used, but also that this category is um, largely responsible for the buildup of stocks. So this, these are the new roads and the new buildings and all that infrastructure that still keep, keeps being added to, to stock in society. Um, and then the other two represent the fossil fuels, which are very non-linear by definition. Uh, once you've burnt the stuff, you cannot use it again. Uh, and the biomass, which is used a little bit in, in a combination of two things, um, but, uh, and, and some of it's used for energy purposes where it's dissipated, but nature does the recycling as per the left wing of the Ellen MacArthur butterfly, which Aisha showed us earlier on. My final slide is also from this paper, and this is where the authors develop some indicators for circularity. Um, and, and they are based on the previous diagrams. And they show us uh, indicators on the input side and on the output side. And essentially the, the colors uh, are almost to be read like a traffic light. Red is very non-circular. Orange is not great. Um, and blue and green are where we want to be. Um, the green relates largely to the biomass and it's uh, referred to as uh, the ecological cycling rate potential that is only truly sustainable if the biomass is harvested from sustainably managed resources. And so one needs more information about that. Uh, but if the biomass is harvested in that way and released, uh, into nature so that nature can recycle it, then it is consistent with circular economy principles. The blue shows what the current socioeconomic cycling is, uh, is achieving. So these are socioeconomic processes that take waste materials. And so almost 15% of waste in, in Europe uh, is recovered and recycled back, but it amounts to only just under 10% of the inputs into the economy. Um, the red is largely related to fossil fuels. So on the output side, uh, a good third of the problem of non-circularity relates to Europe's habit of still using fossil fuels, and that is shrinking at the moment. And then it leaves really the stuff in, in yellow, which is material that currently goes to waste at about 17% that could still be recycled. So there's still potential to squeeze out a little bit more on the output side. Um, but that alone will not lead to, to full circularity. And, and one of the major insights we get on this is that the attention needs to also shift on why the inputs are so much larger than the outputs and what is going on in the buildup of stocks? And is it just that people are hoarding yet another set of used phones in their homes and having a larger home with more, you know, another roof, uh, another room built on or another story built on, or that they're having a second or a third car that is also just standing around? Um, you know, so are the stocks actually being used productively? So hopefully that's given you some insights into how the material flow analysis method is used and what we're trying to do for South Africa. I just want to go back very briefly to this diagram of China, and I could go to the European one as well, to say since I'm speaking to uh, an audience uh, that is familiar with mining and metals, 
um, one of the numbers that we need to uh, pay attention to and, and get right is this unused extraction. And for many of the mining sectors, we've made good progress, uh, but there are some sectors where uh, getting a, a good aggregate, uh, aggregate number for what's going on is, is proving to be a bit harder. Iron ore and coal are, are two sectors, for example, that I'm struggling with a little bit. So if anybody's got good numbers of, of how much unused extraction there is, stuff that's taken out the ground and put on a heap, heap straight away, um, I would, uh, I would uh, appreciate that. Right. Thank you so much, um, Haru. Thank you, Aisha. Okay, so I've got a few questions that I'm going to run through from the chat. And um, the first three, <coughs> excuse me, are for Sally. Um, so when we're speaking about leasing, what is the cost to the leasee and the responsibility on the leasee? Or how do we reconceptualize consumer responsibility and consumer protection in this new kind of leasehood system? And then concerns around nationalization and how it tends towards um, capital flight, especially in the South African context. So how do we marry the positives of nationalization with the da dangers of uh, capital flight? Uh, we have a comment that also kind of responds to that um, from Elise saying that public private participation does tend to balance and help uh, balance this approach to nationalization. And then the third point, Sally, that I would like you to speak on is the issue around international the international flow of goods and how do we maintain responsibility for that so there's three questions around um leasehood and protecting the leasey um nationalization and capital flight and and um, international uh, flows great thanks guys for providing the most difficult questions which i have very <laughs> few answers for um because these are, especially from the metals and mining perspective, these are very, very new concepts. Um, from uh, with some of the models that are being shared at the moment, um, like I mentioned, um, sorry, I'll put my video on. Um, I've mentioned the washing machine example, and someone said, well, wouldn't this cost more than if you had a leasing arrangement? And that is traditionally the case here in South Africa. For example, when before I actually purchased a new car, I looked at a leasing model for a car um, and leasing structures here in South Africa are more expensive um, than, than actually owning your own car or, and, and just due to the nature of where I am, I actually need a vehicle. I, I can't use a, a sharing model, unfortunately. Um, and yeah, so the, the leasing model itself does need to be uh, reviewed. Um, internationally, these are, are taking shape. Um, and the washing machine, for example, was the lease of a pay per wash. So you didn't have this capital, just because you had the machine in your house, it only charged you every time you, um, you wash your clothes. It's kind of similar to photocopiers. A lot of offices now would have a photocopier machine in their office and they pay per page that is printed. So you're not necessarily, um, so, and then the company maintains ownership um, of that and refurbishes and maintains and makes sure, make sure, uh, makes certain that it works appropriately. And the other examples um, in terms of um, the automotive sector, and Harrow and I actually chatted about this the other day in terms of uh, paint, um, uh, paint, uh, Oh, I'm losing my words, people. Um, <laughs> people who supply paint to the automotive industry. And um, instead of, um, they pay per car um, that is painted. They don't pay, the, the manufacturer doesn't pay for the amount of paint that is purchased. So the producer of the paint wants to make sure that you, they get as much coverage per car because they get more money for it, right? So it's a win-win situation is what we're trying to strive for. So the leasing um, arrangements on the metal side, I think needs to be explored. Like what, how would this actually work? Um, especially from a nationalization point of view. I think when I hear that word, I actually tremble myself because it has got such ne negative connotations with it. 
And perhaps a public-private partnership is something that could work. But how do we maintain some sort of, instead of Africa um, be, being the, such an extractive economy and literally handing over our precious resources only to be reprocessed somewhere else, and then we buy in these reprocessed goods and um, goods, how can we add that value and maintain some sort of um, ownership of those resources. Um, and when I say I use the term ownership in a very loose way, um, I'm meaning more how do we retain some of that value in Africa as opposed to just purely handing it over. So that debate I think needs to be thrashed out. Um, and perhaps the example of using some sort of traceability to maintain that stock um, it doesn't mean that stock will ever come back to be reprocessed here. It means that there is still some sort of um, um, uh, fee structure that, that maintains um, a flow of value back. The circular economy, yes, is built around economic models, but it also is much more than that. Um, so we need to take into account many more aspects than just the financial or the economic arguments. Has that so answered no, the questions? No, that's perfect. Great. <laughs> um, so the next two questions I think will be for Linda. So um, Tandazile asks, since the start of the initiatives and interventions towards waste recycling, has there been any changes in stats, i.e. stream volumes available for recycling or new technologies emerging and being adopted slash domesticated for some waste, if not most streams. And then another question directed to Linda is uh, processing for some of the scraps locally, rather exporting them for processing is, sorry, Ooh, yes. Um, I think it's one of the scraps locally, rather exporting them for processing is a low hanging fruit as the energy consumption is lower in most cases than required for processing primary resources. And then, and this is particularly important for an energy stressed country as ours. Furthermore, the processing technologies of interest are not always complex. Um, and then I think Henrik also gave you a question around policy and what improvements we could make to accommodate the circular economy in South Africa. I need to unmute myself before I go off. Um, so in terms of the first question, um, you know, it's a, it's a really difficult one to know. And I think uh, Harrow will, will know this as well in terms of getting reliable waste data for South Africa. Um, we have the 2011 baseline study. We have the new state of waste report. But both of those reports are largely model data, not accurate kind of Weybridge data. So on the one hand, there kind of is an expectation that our you know, that our economy has grown, our middle class has grown, which tends to kind of consume more. Having said that, at least for the last few years, we've had a fairly stagnant economy in terms of growth. And we know that there's a direct correlation between, um, between GDP and, and economic growth and waste generation. So um, it's, it's really difficult to tell in terms of how much our waste streams have increased and um, whether we've seen, for example, significant increases in electronic waste but when it comes to technologies, we've been very, very slow in terms of transitioning to alternative waste treatment technologies, for example. Um, even our e-waste sector, when we did the study on the pre-processing, the dismantling pre-processing and processing technology landscape for South Africa, a lot of e-waste recyclers said that they would be ready to invest in technologies to beneficiate uh, or to process that e-waste locally but they were reluctant to do that as yet because there wasn't a kind of a guaranteed feedstock of supply of e-waste into the value chain. So because so many government departments, and we know government is, uh, the last data I saw was that government was the largest producer of e-waste in South Africa. Um, and a lot of that is being stockpiled in, in basements, in storerooms, et cetera. So until such time as we find a way of quickly and easily unlocking that e-waste into the value chain, the recyclers were reluctant to invest in the technology. So it was all around kind of supply and demand. And this speaks to, for example, the leasing mod mod model that, um, that Sally Ann spoke about was, you know, my question to government is, 
and I suppose this applies to universities, to business, is why do we buy our laptops, computers, printers, et cetera? Why do, we not, uh, why do we not lease them? So that when they reach end of life or end of the lease cycle, they are returned back into the value chain and then either repaired, refurbished or recycled as a way of making sure that we are not sitting with those stocks, as Harrow mentioned, um, you know, within our homes and our businesses. So I'm, I'm disappointed in terms of the slow uptake of alternative technologies. Uh, and very much this speaks to the, the comment that was raised around, um, around the policy and the economic environment is that, you know, we do need a stable policy environment for business to make these kinds of investments. And certainly in the waste sector, we've seen, um, you know, we've seen a flood of new regulation of new norms and standards. Um, so we need some level of policy certainty. Um, and, and I think then business will, will step up, they will make the investments. The, the importance of public-private partnerships, absolutely, it's something that we need to explore more. Um, and, and even though, as the, the, the one question was, you know, this is very much low-hanging fruit. So why, you know, it, it does require less energy, it requires less water to process these, so why are we not? Um, it just seems, you know, it, it seems so so logical that, that we should be processing these secondary raw materials. And I think it does speak to the economics of it. You know, waste is, um, it's not a point source as you would have in a mine, it's a diffuse source. It sits within everybody's home, within everyone's business. How do you collect it? The cost of collection is a major issue. And so we have to look, at the end of the day, waste is an economic issue. Um, landfilling is still really, really cheap in South Africa. We do not have the kinds of tax incentives or disincentives um, that would make it more affordable or would make it viable for a business to invest in these kinds of technologies. Um, I know that I think it was ITAC that put regulations in place some time ago that essentially made it compulsory for, for people to offer metals locally for, um, for purchase before they exported them elsewhere. Um, but essentially that just delayed the process of export. You know, people would, would offer them locally, but they knew all along that they would in fact export them because they were getting higher prices. And that speaks to also the state of our manufacturing economy. It speaks to demand. So if, if we are not manufacturing to the extent that other countries are, the demand for these materials is less, the price that is being offered is less. So I think there's a lot that needs to be done in terms of understanding the economics around secondary resources and how we make that much more attractive to support local beneficiation. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I see Harry, you've made some comments um, in the chat, but I'd also like you to speak to Deval's question. Um, as a general thought, we can never eliminate the production of various waste streams in all these processes. Are we dodging or postponing the question of sustainable rates and methods of extraction by assuming that a greater amount of recycling will be done to ensure social and ecological balance? Oh, I'm not sure I've fully gotten the whole question that Deval put to me there. Um, but uh, yeah, I think what, what we understand is that this transition to more circular economies is a gradual one. Um, and to, on the one hand, it, it depends on the dynamic of stock accumulation. So as an economy gets uh, more mature, it will do less stock accumulation, but we're not yet modeling that very well. Um, and therefore it will buy less materials. Um, and, and so I think Linda did give us that that warning that, that our major customers, as it were, of primary resources are slowing down. Uh, and that has a, you know, a, a big impact on our GDP if we don't adapt to that. And so it's, it's important that we understand that once Shanghai CBD has been built, uh, it's not gonna be built again. Um, the stocks are now there and the Chinese will pull out the valuable materials and recycle them when they want to refurbish that CBD. Um, and so, you know, things won't last forever. Um, I'm not fully answering the question, I think. So if Deval wants to, to take a second go at me and, and, and articulate that a bit better, by all means. Um, 
Aisha, could I maybe contribute, perhaps? Go for it. Yeah, I think I think because um, I hear what Deval saying as well, just to to a degree. But I'm just thinking, maybe to put up at the top of everyone's minds again, with the concept of the circular economy is all is the word design. Design is our is the first intent, right, of what we plan to do. And one of the things that we really need to start doing is redesigning um, the way we consume, the way we produce, the way we manufacture, all these things. And like Haro said, it, it won't be um, an overnight success. It will take time and certain industries will move faster than others. But for example, just in the packaging space, it's really trying to say, how do we, um, design our packaging better so that we're not just designing for recycling. We're actually designing that's uh, packaging that's fit for purpose. So really trying to say, what is the intent of getting this product to the consumer? We want to, you know, so it's really just maybe just opening that up a little bit as well, because mining is, yeah, um, I think we get stuck with it because we think that that's the only way. But there, we, we really need to rethink and un, um, undo certain of our training to, to move beyond what, what circular economy could actually mean and the potential opportunities it could bring. And it's not an easy one. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, I could keep this going forever, uh, considering the recycling pile behind me I've definitely got like a stake in the conversation <laughs> thought I'd mention that this isn't me hoarding boxes <laughs> um, I would like to ask one last uh, point and to, to each of the panelists what has been your experience with multi-stakeholder engagement with regards to the circular economy in South Africa and uh, yeah just a little bit about your experience and what you think could potentially be done better. Um, shall we do Linda? And then Sally and then Karen. I think first and foremost is that there is not a clear understanding of what the circular economy is. So I think first and foremost is that we actually need to do a lot more in terms of educating um, stakeholders, whether it be in government, uh, in business, in, in academia, on what the circular economy is. And then secondly, to improve our understanding, as I mentioned, in terms of the social, the economic and the environmental opportunities that it provides. Um, so I think for me, you know, that's the focus right now is getting everybody onto the, onto the same page to really, really understand that this provides a significant opportunity for South Africa going forward in terms of how it manages its resources and how it supports future economic development and how it provides access to goods and services for so many South Africans that can't afford to do it or can't afford to access those goods and services in the traditional kind of ownership based model. Thanks. Yeah, I concur uh, 100%. Um, definitely there's this uh, um, view that the circular economy represents uh, another term for recycling, it's definitely ensuring that that isn't taken forward, that we need to get this clear understanding of what it, what it does mean, what the terms mean, and getting people to collaborate and partner more openly, especially when it comes to certain, uh, well, government departments. Um, often I found um, over the last couple of years is that certain departments want to spearhead the circular economy as opposed to working together. Um, and um, uh, the Department of Science and Technology being amazing in trying to pull those government departments together. And I think the, the strength will lie in, in collaborating and partnering and, and moving together as opposed to trying to forge separate paths um, with this. Yeah. Uh, from my side, um, Asha, the question on multi-stakeholder engagement is, is one that I uh, um, often want to dodge a little bit. Um, I do dynamic complexity rather than uh, stakeholder complexity. Uh, that's the ex expertise of, of some other folk. 
Um, I'm thinking of Ralph Hammond at the business school of UCT as a, an expert on multi-stakeholders. Uh, but, you know, we can't dodge it and we shouldn't dodge it. If you want to speak to different stakeholders, you have to understand that they come with different interests uh, and vested interests um, and that they need to be spoken to in a language that they understand and that they will need to, to be presented with information uh, that gives them indicators on how well their interests are being looked after as opposed to the interests of others so that they can also engage constructively with others. And so when we speak about indicators uh, for a circular economy, we're back into the space that Dunda mentions. We need to understand its economic implications, its social implications, and its implications for the natural environment. Um, and so as much as I presented uh, a very technical version of circular economy, economy today, by looking only at material flows, what I want to maybe leave the audience with is that that's only the starting point. Uh, you can't do, as we say in chemical engineering, an energy analysis before you've done a mass analysis. You've got to get your mass balance before you do your energy balance. And, and likewise, in the circular economy, I don't think we can talk about seriously, quantitatively, about the numbers of jobs that could be created or lost by going to a more or less circular way um, or the uh, impacts on water use of a more or less circular economy or any other indicator, the, the, the addition to GDP or, or you know, economic indicator, if we do not have the quantitative basis of the flows in the current model and the future model nailed down with enough certainty. Um, so it's a necessary start, uh, and thereafter we must translate it into indicators for the stakeholders. Um, and we would advocate using a life cycle sustainability approach bolted on top of the material flow analysis to translate that mass balance into uh, economic, social, and environmental in indicators. So that's uh, my thought of uh, a research agenda for the next five years. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, communication, right? It's so difficult. Um, Zoom doesn't make it any better. Can't, can't stand presenting to a completely silent external world. It's bizarre. But I would like to thank the panelists so much for joining us today. It was a really fruitful discussion. And for the participants sending through your questions, very insightful points have been made in the comments as well. Um, I would urge you to read through them and um, thank you so much for sticking it out. I'm sorry that we went a little bit over time, but I couldn't, I couldn't resist. Um, <laughs> seriously, sorry. Next time I'll be stricter. But thank you so much, everyone. And I hope you have a lovely Thursday. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye.